administration. Yes, thank you. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to our site council meeting. And I didn't know if we'd have more families here tonight than the usual crowd, but I'm so glad to see all of you who are here. Um, why don't we do what we usually do? I would like to formally introduce my boss, who is an associate superintendent. Her name is Rochelle Cox. She has that groovy background that says Minneapolis Public Schools. And I've known Rochelle for a really long time, like 25 years or some ridiculous amount of time. So it's, it's been a great year for me to have a boss that I actually know. And um, she's here tonight to talk to you about some um, attrition plans that happen through Minneapolis Public Schools when um, a principal is going to go bye-bye. So we're going to talk about that eventually, but let's go around and um, popcorn to somebody who um, I will start and say who I am. And then if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves so that Rochelle could at least know you a little more than just the little names. I'm Donna, I'm the principal, proud principal of Marcy. This is year 16 and I'm hanging it up at the end of the year and we're gonna be happy. And um, we're gonna be so glad that um, this school has survived all this stuff. <laughs> And I'm going to pass the introductions. Oh, good. Hi, Anissa. To Marie. Hi, I'm Marie Kent. Um, I'm a parent. I, my third grader is in Berkeley's class. And my first grader, hi, Berkeley, is in Miss Ashley's class. Oh, um, my third grader just walked by very loudly. This year, I'm also classroom support for kindergarten. Um, but I'm going to school. Clearly, I'm in scrubs. So I'm only working this year. Next year, I'm just a parent. Pass it to somebody, Marie. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know how to do that. Um, Emmy Higgs Masner. Hello. Um, I am Emmy. And sorry, I'm a little frazzled. Le uh, Leora's bus just <laughs> just got to Marcy to pick them up. Um, but my husband went to go get her. Anyway, she is in kindergarten <laughs> in Joy's class. And yes, we're happy to be back at school. Um, I don't know who has gone yet. Um, if you haven't gone, oh, no, anybody. You're the third Great. person, Emmy, so. Pick anyone right. except Marie or Donna. Sounds good. Berkeley. Hi, I am Berkeley. I am a third grade teacher at Marcy. Happy to see you all. Happy to be here. I will pass it to Claire. Hi, I'm Claire Trolley. Uh, my oldest is a first grader in Nicole's classroom, and I will pass it over to Mike. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mike Hogan. Um, my son Emmett is in second grade. Um, was that all I was supposed to say? Just that? Okay. Um, I'll pass it over to Abra. I'm Abra. I have a second grader and a fifth grader currently attending Marcy. And I'll pass it over to Laura. Uh, hi, I'm Laura. My son Leo is a kindergartner in Stacy's class, and um, I'll pass it to Susanna. Uh, hi, I'm Susanna, the bilingual program assistant and this year, and I'm happy to be here to see everybody. I popcorn to Anissa. Hi everybody, happy Thursday. My name is Anissa. I work here at Mercy as a bilingual associate educator. And this is my first time being here, I mean, in the school this year. And I'm happy to be here and yeah, I'm able to participate in this meeting. Who's gonna go next? I'm not sure. I'll pass it down to Dana. I pass it to Jen. 
Hi, I'm Jen Dozak. I am one of the uh, ASD teachers, autism uh, group. I have the older students for third through fifth graders this year. And sorry, I missed the beginning. Is there anybody else that hasn't gone yet? I can go. I'm Kate. I have a kindergartner in Stacy's class and a third grader in KDP slash Megan's class. Um, Sonia, do you want to go? Yeah, I'm Sonia. I have a kindergartner named Foxy who is um, on homebound education because of disability, but is in Miss Joy's class. Um, and I will have to leave tonight at 6.30. Special Education Advisory Council usually does first Thursdays, but because of spring break, they're on second Thursdays, and I'm helping with the presentation there tonight, so I apologize for my early need to depart, but I will for sure watch the playback up on Facebook, and I will popcorn to Trinity. Hi, everyone. Oh. Okay, we're gonna try that again because that always happens when we're in the same office together. I'm Trinity, I'm the assistant principal. I also have a second grader in Tamsin's class and a fourth grader in this class at Marcy. And I will popcorn it to Sydney. Can you hear me? Hi, everybody. Happy Thursday. I'm Sydney. I'm family and community liaison. I have two kids who went all the way through the program and I'm glad to be here. I think I'm last, possibly. We just had someone else join us and I think Trinity, oh, Trinity just went, but yep, we just have someone else. Yenevest, am I pronouncing your name right? You're right, you're right. The young we said. Um you already started or no? We were just doing introductions. So if you'd like to introduce yourself um uh and share uh your your child's grade and teacher at Marcy, that would be lovely. Uh yeah, um yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Yang Wise Hyung, and I'm a parent. I have a little one, uh, my daughter, uh, Sebi Hyung, attending. Um, kidding, it's a cutting kind of gun uh, attending um, Miss Joy's class. So, um, yeah, I know, I know that you, uh, you have, you know, a, a meeting before, and this is my first time. So, I think I just, you know, come in and to join you guys and see, you know, how's it going on and also support the, the school and support the meeting, okay? Thank you so much for joining us. And there are several um, several new faces uh, today. So thank you all for coming. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just laughing at myself, you guys. Okay, so I think the first thing we should do is let Ro Rochelle, um, Rochelle is not only our associate superintendent, but she also has been the person in charge of all the COVID stuff that's been happening through the state. She's our liaison for all of that stuff. So I'd really like her to go first, just to explain kind of what happens when a principal retires and what happens and how you can possibly give input through, as community members and parents. Uh, Rochelle? feel free to go and when you're done, you feel free to go home. <laughs> well, it's really a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, I'm Rochelle Cox. I've been in the district for 25 years. Um, worked all my way from, I was a early childhood special education teacher and all the way up through special education. Uh, spent a lot of time there. And this year um, I started working with back. So this is very bittersweet for me. I'm super happy for Donna, but um, I know it's going to be a big loss for us and big shoes to fill. So I just wanted to stop by. Um, 
I believe that the role of the site council is really important in this whole process. So I wanted to explain um, kind of the process that the associate superintendents and human resources have put together. So each school's site council, so for Marcy and to replace Principal Andrews, will manage kind of the inner interview team process. So that's really going to be your, your work as a collective site council. So you will select who the interview select team and there will be one person from the site council that will sit on the interview team to be the liaison back to the site council team. So the site council is really responsible for developing a survey that will go out to the broader school community to gauge interest and participation on the interview team. They will also develop pre-established process and criteria for selecting the interview team candidates who express interest and are willing to commit to the time obligation. Um, usually it's about four to five hours of interviews, one to two evenings, depending on how many candidates we have. So the site council president will work with myself and I'll help them through any of the process and have any questions they would have um, as we go. Um, as we go through, the interview team size is typically between eight to 10 people. So that would be one person from your site council. One person that I'll work with, um, you know, Donna and Trindy, I'll probably come to an instructional leadership team meeting. We'll have one representative from the instructional leadership team in the school. And then we'll have four, four parents, four parents and community members, and four staff people. So that'll give us a nice even, even balance. It is really our goal to have the demographics of our interview team match the demographics of Marcy School. So we wanna make sure that we're really being representative to the whole community as we go through this process. Um, with the night of the, the night that we do the interview process, oh, I should back up. So I, I know you've seen that um, I sent out a leadership survey for, that'll be a profile that we'll look at and, and HR will help us look at that. And that will really help us determine from a pool of candidates who might be six to seven um, candidates that match the needs and the values of the Marcy community. So right now, all the associates and principals um, so like tomorrow, I have probably eight interviews with principal candidates to get into our principal pool. I'll be doing those interviews with two other principals that are currently sitting in Minneapolis public schools. The candidates will go through that interview process. They'll also um, do a simulation of feedback and coaching to a teacher. They also go through um, some writing exercises. So it's a pretty rigorous process that happens before the candidates get to you um, and your interview team at Marcy. So once we get that team and we get the date set, um, then we'll do those interviews. Um, typically the teams will come up with one or two finalists and those finalists will go to the superintendent for a final interview I'll attend with and the superintendent will make the final decision. So that's kind of how the process works. So the site council really plays a, an integral role because they know the community so well and really make the decision of who sits on that, on that team to make sure that we have a representative group of people. Um, I always like to have the more the better. So I'd love to see four staff people and four parents, but if we can only get three, that's, that's fine too as we move forward. So again, as we move forward, We'll, our, our first real task is to decide what our process will be for, for deciding who will be that interview team, develop a survey so we can see who's interested, and then you as a site council team will pick the interview team. So that's a broad overview. Claire, it looks like you have a question. Yeah, I have, a couple, I have a couple sure. of questions. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, the, the first question I have is you said that, you know, kind of first the principal applicants are kind of brought in at a, at a larger group. Are these principal applicants for just Marcy or for all principal open positions throughout the district? Yep, for all principal and AP positions across the district. So the pool is typically open for about a month. 
and we'll typically have anywhere from 50 to 100 candidates in there. And that's the pool that HR and the associate and myself will pull once we get that leadership profile from Marcy and, and pick out six to eight candidates for um, Marcy interview team to interview. So you will pick out the six to eight candidates? With human resources, correct. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, and then my next question is, what is the timeline here? Because you said, hey, the superintendent will make the final decision. Mm -hmm. But as we know, Superintendent Graf is leaving June 30th. Yep. So is it this interim that we have no idea who it may be who will make the final decision or will it be Superintendent Graf? What's the, what's the kind of timeline for the hiring process? I'd really like us to be interviewing those first weeks in May. Um, I, I always like to get an early jump because we'll have other schools that are also pulling from that candidate pool. And we also know that candidates are probably applying in other districts too. So I think, you know, I want, I want this group to feel comfortable with the process that we're using and that they have time to pick a good interview team. So I'll work with um, the president and of the site council and and Donna to really kind of set that timeline and look at C, but I'm, I'm kind of shooting for that second week of May for interviews. So if, I'm sorry, just, just one more follow-up. I know Sonia sure. has a question too, but if, if we're looking at interviews in that first week of May, would that mean that we would make a recommendation and then that person would in theory be hired like before Memorial Day weekend? It's possible, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and hired that would mean they would sign a contract for the 22-23 um, school year. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Claire, my questions were literally your exact two same questions, so I'm covered, thank you. Awesome. Anybody my else? Much a a question as um, a suggestion. Well, first of all, Donna, congratulations. <laughs> um, I, I did not know that, and I'm pretty attuned to stuff. So I imagine that most people at Marcy did not know that you were retiring. Um, the weird thing is, the, I, I did write it in parent, I wrote a whole thing for Parents Press. Okay. And Maybe I missed that week. It was a couple weeks ago, right before it was between the the um the strike time and the spring break time that's when i wrote it april 1st thank you april fool's day but you kind of put it at the end of so maybe they read part of it and didn't get to the bottom <laughs> well anyway my suggestion would be to to make it known within our community <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that's a great idea. And I think as we think about that survey, we might want to really think about putting like a, a beginning paragraph on that, that really talks about, you know, hey, here's what's happening, we can maybe even copy down on what you wrote before, and then kind of jump into the survey and that we're looking for people to sit on the interview team. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry you guys didn't know. I don't mean to surprise anybody. I've been talking about it to staff all year, especially the ones that have worked with me a long time because they don't believe it. And then when we got back after the strike, we had a big circle and I announced it formally and then there was just silence. And I thought, uh oh, but it was fine. People talked to me afterwards, but they were surprised that I really have made that decision. But I do it with a happy heart, you know, I'm still love my job and I still love the kids and I have strong feelings that this school will survive and thrive just the way it always has. So thank you for that. But yeah, I'm sorry if somebody, some people didn't know. Surprise. So Rochelle, is there other things you want to share with us about this? Uh, does anybody have any questions about this for Rochelle? I have one more question for Rochelle, if that's okay. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, the process of picking from the, the larger pool, the candidates that will be um, go through the process for Marcy specifically, how do you, what is the matching sort of procedure like? Like, how do you take that pool and say, you know, we think that this person might be a particularly good candidate at this particular site? or in this um, school community and who's involved with that process. And a, a second question, how many open principal and AP um, slots are there that you'll be pulling from this pool for? And okay, third question, um, about how, 
about how large is the pool, the whole thing? Like how many people are you talking to when all is said and done for these spots? Yeah, great questions. Okay, so um, the process for, for kind of picking the candidates to come before this interview team, um, it'll be myself and there's a, 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 a project manager, um, director in HR who solely looks at um, principal hiring. So he really kind of navigates everything, sets up interviews, knows the candidates, runs them through their written activities and their simulations. So between the two of us, what we'll do is we'll take all the responses from that leadership survey. And what I do is I kind of create a rubric from that. So I look at all the points that people are looking at, and then I start to look across the candidates and I prior prioritize them. So especially like take for instance at Marcy, like we're looking for someone with a pretty strong art background right so those are things that kind of put, come to the to rise to the top for me then I'll do is I'll do a rubric and I'll look at the candidates and move through them um, elementary experience you know we'll just look at all those pieces and then from that it'll start to, to sift out who will be those top candidates based on that profile so it really is kind of just a matching exercise from what we're hearing from families, community, and staff about what they're looking for in a leader. So when we do our interviews and when we get from the written activities and the simulation, we're writing notes all the time and looking at different attributes of people. So very strong in teacher feedback or very strong in, um, in um, community partnerships, you know, things that we're seeing that are popping out to us and then we're starting to make matches. So. Um, so that's how we pick them. And it's, it is Daniel and myself who does that. Um, right now, I believe there is, I'm counting my head, there's probably about six schools that are open right now for principal um, positions for next year. So that's kind of what we have right now. Um, you know, as things go through, through the school year, there might be further openings, but so we have right now. Typically in the pool, um, there's around 50 candidates that make it. You know, um, and so we have, and, and each of those have like a strongly recommend or recommend. And then there's some that are on um, what we'll call a waiting list because they might have just a, a really specialized niche that is important. We see some potential in them, but we might pair them in a different way. Also, we look at those candidates and we say, um, do we think that they're ready to be an, a, an assistant principal? Are they ready to be a principal or are they ready for both? And we ask them what their preference is too on that. Thank you so much for explaining all that. I really appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I have a question. Uh, you talked about um, that there were four staff, you wanted to have four staff members and four parents. Um, and then my children got really loud and I missed what you said next. So I had to come upstairs. Um, I'm interested in being part of that. Um, right now I'm a parent and also a staff member. So how does that work? Great question. So I think I think it will be important for you guys as a team because I know that as, as Donna said, this might've been the first time for some people because they're just really interested in the process. So I think the first thing is whoever is the president, Claire, is that you? Are you the president of the site council? Hmm. Okay. So I think so. Okay. Uh, who, whoever is the principal, Donna, can let me know, but I think it would be really important to kind of define who is the site council for this particular activity. And the reason is, is because in this process, the site council can only have one person who can, who is the liaison who's going to sit on the interview team because the site council is really gonna have where their influence and, and, and thought process is gonna come in is that selection period. So, so one person from the site council will be it, then anybody else who wants to be in it. Oh, and then one person from the instructional leadership team. So those two people, and then this team will decide the process and develop the survey to pick the other four parents and four staff members. So you know so, and oh sorry go ahead so um just to clarify does that mean that only one person from site council can be on the interview team correct okay so then the other four parents presumably could not be associated with the site council or I, I, how I would, 
Yeah, I would say, Claire, it would be really important for people to uh, Rochelle, you have a com to have a conversation of being the survey, looking about uh, criteria, deciding, Wait, looking Michelle, through that and making that? decisions about who is going to be on the interview team. I think we should be really clear about who that is and who doesn't want to be part of that process because they might want to be actually on the interview team. No guarantees that they'll be picked by the state council, but I think before we get started, I would I would have people make decisions about where where they want to be in the process. Uh, Can I'm you sorry, you getting again? You you uh, you froze, then it came back, and I missed the most important important part at the beginning of what you said. Oh, okay, um, so I'm I'm trying to go back to see where I was. Donna, could you give me a clue as to where I where I froze? Uh, no, I can't. Okay. It was kind of near the beginning, though. So, okay. so the most important part, and then she froze. Yeah, you said the most important part, and then you froze. Okay. So I think um, the most important. I don't know what my most important part was for that moment, but I will start. To. I'll start over and and say I I think it would be very important for people to make a decision about whether they'll want to be part of the site council at this for this activity because that will be, they will be choosing who's going to sit on that interview team. So there will be lots of influence into that. Or I might say, hey, I'm going to sit out of that activity in site council and I'm going to probably go through the survey and I might apply to be a person sitting on the interview team. So I think there's just a difference in roles there. Um, and because they want to get a variety, a wide range of views and of, of, of people that have an opportunity to influence who is the next principal. They want to keep those separate and make sure that parents and staff members are making decisions all the way. So it's not me making the survey or deciding who's on the site council, but it really, or who's on the interview team, but that really is, is a transparent and really school driven process through. Well, you've left us speechless. So what's our next step, Rochelle? What will this, what will this committee be looking for? Yep, so once you decide who's gonna be the site council for this activity, that group should get together, establish the criteria of who they're looking for in an interview team and develop the survey. And I'm available to be a partner in that or to answer questions or however you want me involved in that piece. Once okay. that group makes that survey, gets that out, they are also the decision makers and will send me the names of the of the um, of the interview team with that makeup that we talked about. One site council person, one instructional leader, someone from the instructional leadership team, and Donna and I can take care of that. Then four family members and four staff people. And again, a value that we have in Minneapolis public schools and that we'd like the site council to also have is that it it matches the demographics of your school. And I, I've, I've looked at that and I can give those numbers to whoever the president is just so that they have kind of those percentages in their head. So do we get it? We could even talk about this after Rochelle leaves. Yeah, and I'm happy to sit down we with you, Claire, care. or whoever, and kind of go through it. Or I'm totally fine if you guys are like, "Hey, we got it. We're we're going for it. Whatever works for you." Any other questions, you guys? Thank you, Associate Superintendent Cox, for joining us here today. I never in those formal, when she calls me Principal Andrews, I get emails about it then. So, because I'm so informal. But anyway, thank you so much for coming yeah. to explain it to them. And then we'll just move forward. And somebody who we decided is now the chair of this group is going to take the reins. Reach out to me. Okay, yeah. that sounds great. I will, I will wait to hear from that. And then Donna, I'll connect with you tomorrow or Monday just to talk about the instructional leadership team. So we get that person. So good.
Thank you. All right. Have a great Bye. night, everybody. It was really nice to meet you all. Look forward to working with you in this process. Thanks. Why don't you leave and then I can, I'll, and I'm, then I can I'm talk gonna, about you. Okay, I'm going to say one thing. Okay. I'm going to just say it to everybody. Okay. Um, I'm going to exit this process because just so everybody knows, I really am very interested in being the principal of Marcy. And I feel a little bit awkward staying for this portion of the meeting. <clears throat> Donna and I debated on if I should come at all, but she's like, you know, it's just information at the beginning and you're always there. So I, I'm going to go. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks, Trinity. So here we are again. I think we should just, it, it, as usual in education, it was about as clear as mud for a while there for me. I don't know if the rest of you guys feel like that, but let me tell you how I got hired for this job. The other principal left and I got hired on like August 16th. And they said, guess what? You got promoted. And I'm like, where's the school? And they told me it's Marcy Open School. And I'm like, where is it? That's how I got I didn't have to go through that tough process, but that's great. That's fine. I'm glad that they're doing it that way. And, and honestly, what it sounds like is somebody has to be the leader of the pack here for, um, for connecting with Rochelle. So, so I guess, um, it's still a little unclear to me. Uh, Kate was very helpfully looking in the bylaws. Um, as to who the site council president is. I know I am the chair for Family Connections, but does that also make me the president of site council? Because I'm happy to uh, do something, but I also don't want to take over because um, I don't know the- We, we, never, um, we never established it when Donna created site council. So uh, in the past, there have been like, co-chairs yeah but, um like we used to have a staff person and uh parent parent that co-chaired them so right now we don't have a president does somebody want to be it anybody else besides claire want to because i mean if you're interested in it and it's a little bit processy and you're a lawyer already, so you probably know how to talk through all that gobbledygook, that'll be good. As the principal, I, know, I just want to make sure that when we have, you know, we don't have a lot of people come of color come to our meetings, and we need to have them represented on the committee. And I can absolutely give you names of parents. <laughs> well, yeah, Susana would love to be on it, but she could do the staff member part. So Claire, that's the one thing, I mean, as we move forward on this, we just have to make sure it's balanced so that it's fair and and then you have to spend some hours sitting there listening to candidates but it could be kind of fun because like i said i didn't get hired this way i've never worked for anybody who left so i've never gone through it from the other end but it sounds like there's a pretty equitable process to be had um and rochelle is a really down-to-earth great person well, so, we, we send out the survey to the entire school body, right? Okay. And we'll send it in multiple languages to right. I attempt am, I mean, to cast the we, widest net possible. Correct. We we put it on, didn't we put it on the website already? I can't remember if Trinity did that, but I have the le three letters in three languages. Did they go on the parent? In the, it's gonna it's going on the website and then we're going to, we're going to, um, send the links electronically um as well as in the parents press but i don't know I mean, if you want to send paper copies too or not so the survey is set by the district well this survey yeah. thing is really about because i looked at it of course and it's like a bunch of questions that say what are the qualities that you think a principal should have and so then there's like 50 of them and you're supposed to pick six or 10 or something like that. So that Rochelle sent that to me and that's, I know, but it's just very broad because they're, that's what they want first. And then once that group is decided as to who's going to be the interview team, that's the one that really is going to hone in on other things. 
So does the survey also include an option to say like, yes, I want to be part of the interview team? No, not that oh. I saw. Well, but can, I, was, can we modify the survey sure. then to have that be included? I think that we, might we can add that language. It's just a survey monkey that goes to Rochelle Cox. So if you want, we can collect people and then you can, Donna can go through and balance them in yeah, terms like of demographics. If you need more families of color who don't usually attend or whatever, I mean, we have to, we have to consider that. And there are parents who will be really thrilled at participating in something like this. They just don't go to parent council, but they're very, they have strong voices and They'll have good comments and stuff to say about our school and about what they think would be important. So that'd be good. Um, but yeah, the survey, I'm too afraid to like go in my emails and see stuff because then I'm afraid I'll lose you guys because I'm an idiot. As Trinity said, okay, boomer. I, I don't appreciate her. But anyway, um, she. I think that the first step is this thing, but I wanted to get going because because as much as I want Trinity to take over, because that will make sense to the school, this will make sense to the priorities of the school, how we've moved forward and transitioned from an open school to an arts magnet, how the connections that are made, all that stuff, you know, you never know. So I want it to get done, my replacement to get done before teachers have the opportunity to bid in or out. I'm kind of thinking about the teachers that way, but then that should speed the process up because of course, interview and select where the teachers have the opportunity to possibly change jobs if they want to, um, has been delayed till the end of May. So when somebody said uh, uh, labor uh, Memorial Day weekend, that's pretty close to when it would, it would work. And I just think that, you know, I don't get to say anything about the next principal, I already asked. And, and uh, <clears throat> but I do have a opportunity to say stuff about an assistant principal because oh, I was have, just gonna ask if we then need a new assistant principal, is it the same process or is it different for an AP? Do you just hire or Trinity yeah. just hire an AP? Usually the print, well, here again, I have never been actually lucky enough to participate in a selection process. I've always been given my assistant principal in a variety of reasons. And so um, I have had about 12 assistant principals over 16 years. And I think I should invite them all to my graduation, I mean, retirement party, because I think it's funny that I've had so many of them and they're all still buddies and friends. But um, I, think the, I think the principal, I think they'll probably pick a pool of people that the principal will then talk to. But I don't know if the site council participates in that as well. I kind of think no. I think they're more placed based on what the principal and the associate superintendent are thinking about. It's the principal that's the big one where the community helps. But I know I want to make sure like my strength has always been with special education. So I'm not going to let there not be a strong person who knows special education in this school you know, because it's a big deal, because that's my baby, and then I'm going to go, and Trinity knows it less than I do. She's good at it, but she knows it less than I do, and it takes the whole village to take care of the kids and the staff and the and the teachers the best way we can, so I think that'll happen later. We just have to get this P part done, so is everybody okay with Claire being the representative? Thumbs yes. up if you Is voted. Claire okay with Claire being the representative? <laughs> she, she offered. I heard it. So, I mean, I think it's a process thing. Unless somebody else would really like the opportunity to do this. Okay. I would be very happy to. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that's great. Thank you for saying yes. And it'll be good because I just think because of your skill set. You ask good questions, you'll get through the stuff. Um, so, so then to do right now, yeah. So then, can we see the survey before it goes out? And um, uh, well, hang on. Let me see if I can actually pull it up and add, like, add the question about if you're. I mean, it's it's on the website in three languages. It's already there. It's just what it came from the 
woman who just left, Rochelle. Yeah, that's the, oh. that's the initial survey. So you can see it on the website. Is so, so we have to use that survey. We can't modify it. Cause I guess what I'm worried about is um, it not being super accessible to have 50 questions. And then at the end of the 50 questions be like, oh, by the way, do you want to be a part of this? Like it doesn't- I think it should be completely separate. I think you okay. should try and recruit for this separately from somebody who just wants to say what they think the principle should be like. And, and to clarify- I, I don't think they should be the same. Right, I agree. I agree. Just put it out there. Who would like to be on that? And just leave it at that. It's not 50 questions. It's 50 like traits, not person, well, kind of personality traits or strengths, or it's like fill in the dots of which ones you think are most important. It's kind of like that, but it's long, but you know, and it is in three languages, which is good because yeah. Thank you, Kate, for fixing that. I don't like to touch it. So she just shared it with everybody in the chat. So you can stare at it. But um, yeah. So it's an overview sort of so that let's let's just be honest. So this way, our our super area superintendent, associate superintendent has covered herself as far as letting everybody see some questions and getting feedback from everybody who wants to give it back. So, oh, that's so I need to look at yeah. So I'm looking at the survey, and so it's a it's a survey for like all of the schools that are hiring a principal. It looks like because at the last the last question says which school are you representing, and then you pick from like the list of all the schools. Okay. Yeah, I think it's I think they exactly. list all of the schools. Exactly, it's so just an overview for parent data collection for yeah, so not, input, and that's I mean, like our, our, okay. Yeah, you'll get if to you find guys, as a committee wanted to do a separate one for Marcy families, you could probably do that. I would just check with Rochelle. Yeah, so I just did a quick control F to see if special education is anywhere on that survey. And like, it doesn't say that or like arts because like Trinity has a special ed degree and worked as an art teacher for what, like 13 years. So like, that's something really important to me, but that's not on the survey. So how do we get that reflected? Um, I got the impression that it would be sort of distilled down to this committee to decide what specific things our school needs, right? I mean, yeah. she said yes, specifically actual, looking for an arts teacher, so. And Rochelle knows what she's gonna be looking for. It's just that, um, this is a very broad opportunity for anybody who wants to throw in what they think. Is there, I, I don't know, is there is a note section on there, Jen? Okay, good. So then you can throw in whatever you want. But um, I, I really see this as a way to say, yes, we asked everybody in the community and we got their input. One of those broad things, you know? And then as the group hones into its own little committee, they're the ones that'll do the work of, they'll make the questions, not Rochelle. But she's willing to help you with some questions if you want. So then we do a second survey? Is My that guess what is like that you guys will look at all of the Marcy survey results. Right. And then you'll see the traits or whatever and start formulating questions from there. Again, I said, I've never done this, but it makes sense. And like, I wouldn't let it be bigger than you. Like you guys can just use your voice and, and Claire, I think Kate, any of you can, I mean, you could all do this. If you, if you have a question, just stop the process and say, well, this is what we think we need. Because that is the Marcy way. We do tell them what we need. We're still, yeah, yeah. Um, so just some information before my part of the meeting's over, but I wanted, I'm shifting it a little cause I need to. So we had a budget meeting this morning and it was very interesting because um, we've been waiting here trying to figure out what's gonna happen to us and our staff and the budgets. And we've just been in limbo for a week. and. Understandably, there are teachers who are worried about whether or not 
they're going to lose their jobs again, because we are going to have our budgets opened up. We finished figuring it all out. It took, you know, a long time, but not as long as when I was a new principal. We figured it out. We cut the people we had to cut. It was very painful. It was not my favorite day, but we did what we had to do. We balanced our budget, boom, we're done. Now, because of the costs of what has been negotiated um, through our, the strike that happened and also that's one part of it that has been stated to us. And the other part is that there were more kids that left the district than they thought there would be. So they said, guess what? We're gonna open the budgets again. So I, it's gonna be like starting over. I'm gonna get a new amount of money. I think I'm gonna know on Tuesday. I have 10 days, Trinity and I will work on it and we'll have to rebalance and reshuffle and do all this stuff and then see how it all plays out. I think we're sitting pretty good if you want to use that word right there um, as far as numbers of students are concerned because right now we have about 540. The most we've had was 566 and we were down to like I don't know 502 or 510. So we've we keep getting new teachers and um did i say teachers we keep getting new students and every you know like we got 15 new kids over the winter break i mean over the spring break so we're registering them registering them that's a stressful spot for teachers to be in because they're getting brand new kids you know in april but at least it gives us a lot of numbers and honestly, as, as a school, just second grade is really low. For some reason, we don't have a ton of second graders. Third and fourth are pretty full and we continue to get new kids in every grade level. So, and, and fifth and kindergarten, everybody else is pretty good. Second grade's a little low, but that's the way it goes. So um, by Tuesday, I'll know a lot more about what we're working with, but I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic. There will be some things that as a district, we will totally, um, as a district, everybody will have cut. One of the things that I know for sure is our differentiation specialist, which may not mean a lot to all of you because you haven't worked with a differentiation specialist, but it was kind of like a present the district gave us. Here, you can have a 0.5 teacher who's going to help the general, like, classroom teachers differentiate for really smart kids, low kids, medium kids, all kids. Well, that was a great gift. Oh, the gift is gone. It's gonna be gone because it has to be cut. There are other programs like that that will be affected, but we didn't get a solid list to, for me to tell you about it. Um, so that's all I can tell you about it now, but it, it will be changing and any changes that will affect our school and our class sizes and all that kind of stuff. They said they're going to stay with the same class sizes, which were pretty good, um, 20 to 25 kids, depending on what grade level. But um, that's all I know. I don't know anymore. Do you, do you anticipate it being a major budget difference than the budget you already submitted? Like, do you anticipate that there, there will be quite a bit difference one way or the other? The slides don't... Do? Thank you for asking. The slideshow um, that they showed us said that every department in, in the district building has to cut by 5%. They didn't say that specifically for teachers but or for schools, but I know that there are going to be, it, it's going to be a different budget. It's going to be less. And <clears throat> for next year, there's a there's a clause that the ESP's got that, that we have to offer them a little bit more hours if they want them. So that's gonna affect how many ESP's we have. If we have to give more hours to fewer, then it's gonna affect everything. So yeah, yeah, it's not pretty and I don't really need to tell you guys about it. It'll all work out in the wash and we'll do the most ethical and equitable thing that we can do. But <clears throat> the district's 
worried and taking a hit and, and it, we're all going to be the people affected by it. So they, <clears throat> one of the principals asked <coughs> Ibrahima Diop, who is the finance director, super nice man. Uh, one of the principals said, you know, we see on media a lot, oh, the district has money just laying around and they're just not using it. Why don't they use this big fund of money that they see and all this stuff? And he explained that, which I, I, I really, I really know that we don't have a ton of money laying around. That's how I feel about it. But um, <clears throat> there's a couple million dollars waiting to pay for the things that got ordered for this school year. So we can't spend them because they're, they're spoken for, but it's sitting there. So it looks like there's a couple million just sitting there, but it's to pay for either the, <coughs> the construction projects or the supplies that are happening. And our school will be at the recipient of a new dance room and a new uh, theater classroom. So those things will happen. And I know that we ha they had a budget that money last year. So yeah, I bet it's sitting around. They don't seem to have the money. So yeah, it does it fall on. I mean, principals were very passionate right now because of the school a lot of schools have very few kids. So will that, the question will be was, will that be sustainable as we move forward? They might have to close schools. And anytime you say, maybe they should close some of the schools, people get really emotional about that because it might be their school or whatever. And coming from a school where we all <coughs> have always been really full, I just don't have that chip in me. It's like, well, of course you should close the school with 175 kids. There's, you know, it would make sense rather than having little bits of professionals in that school to combine some schools and have all the professionals in there full time. But, you know, those are Donna, things. Can I ask a question? Yeah. Regarding your new, since they're reopening the budget, does yeah. that mean that those protections for teachers of color will go into effect or is that still not happening until next year because i know we cut a teacher of color i know well no i it's my understanding that that you, i can't hear you am i still talking yeah can you guys hear me okay um it's my understanding that that is a memorandum of agreement that has not, that means a special, what Claire, you can't hear me? No, I don't think the protecting educators of color was a memorandum of agreement. I think that was in the actual contract itself. I don't know whether it goes into effect for the 22, 20, 23 contract. It might go, it might be one year next, but it was it in the contract. Okay, it's one year next though. We don't have that opportunity to do it this year. Which is a good and bad thing all the way around. Even if it was like the contract is starting as of this year. You know, That's what everything's I retroactive. Right. And I right. And I I I asked that on behalf of the teacher of color that I had to cut because we were trying to figure out a way to have her stay because she's paid her due. She's worked here a long time. She's a great teacher, blah, blah, blah. But it, it's just the, the rules sometimes just just slice it and then there's nothing we can do. So that was one of our strategies and that didn't work to my knowledge. But let's wait till Tuesday to see what else, because things have gotten sh shooken up a little bit and we'll see what happens. <clears throat> That's all I wanted to say was about the money. You'll probably be able to read it on the district you know, I'm not a Minneapolis parent at all, so I don't see what you guys see. And Trinity tells me you guys see a lot more than I see, because as parents respond, if you're on the Minneapolis parent Facebook page, I guess, or whatever, whoo, there's a lot of talking and a lot more information than I ever know. So thank goodness Trinity is both, because then she can tell me what's, what's out there. Can I ask an unrelated question, or kind of, you just mentioned that there's some money set aside for a new theater and something else in the school? Yeah. Is that like 
like rehabbing a room into a theater or like building a new room completely? We still have the theater and that's been renovated already. But the room that um, the theater teacher teaches out of is going to be turned into a black box theater. Okay. Gotcha. That money's going there. And then the dance room, which is as big as a, you know, post is stamp, is going to be elongated and, start and made all fancy dancy. So those two things are going to happen this summer when the kids aren't here. Cool. Yeah. So we didn't have to lose that money. So, yeah, we still have never offered hot food here in all the, you know, I've been waiting, hoping to see hot food come across. No, no, not yet. So. Um, there was also a question um, last month about what might need to take place to potentially have these meetings done in person rather than in Zoom, on Zoom. Um, is, is that a possibility for a May or even a June meeting to be done in person? I don't see why not. The only thing I have to double check if, um, if the rule still is that parents have to demonstrate vaccination to come in and volunteer. But even so, if it's just us as adults and we meet in the library or, you know, <clears throat> in the cafeteria, we could socially distance. We had our- I think our, a lot of schools are back to in-person meetings. Good. So it's up to you guys. Maybe wait uh, two, three weeks and see where we're going because right now the numbers are going up and we're not exactly sure if they're going to plateau or go asymptotic. It kind of depends on how well uh, the last they Omicron just dropped the. Protected. Abra, did you see they dropped the mask mandate for Monday? I did. And I also saw they dropped notifying parents if their child has been exposed. And honestly, yeah. that's the part I'm more upset about. The lack of notification, because we get notified about other contagious diseases. It seems like this should be on the list. But in Philadelphia, for, for school, sorry, yeah, like if it, there's strep or lice or you know other diseases like that, you get noticed. Yes, it seems like this should be one of those, considering that it can possibly cause you know long term disability. Okay, it is seven o'clock. We have a couple of people presenting for Family Connections, but I would like to give everyone like a two minute break if you need to stretch your legs or get some water or shovel some food in your face before we um, welcome Josh um, and start the Family Connections meeting. Bye everybody, see you soon. Thanks Donna. Have, have fun connecting with families. Josh, did you have a, a PowerPoint or anything that you wanted to share? I can make you a co-host if you wanted to share your screen. And if not, please don't feel like you have to by any no, means. I've, I've got a very short one. Okay. So does the school board decide to, about the mask mandate? Oh no, Rochelle Cox said that um, it was left up to the superintendent. That's why there was no vote on it on Tuesday's meeting. Oh, and they and and they decided to lift the mandate. I guess that's what the email said. Oh, I didn't see that. <laughs> the email came out like two minutes before the meeting started. Oh, news to me. Meet. Surprise. I, I I just want to jump into Claire and mention I, I apologize for disconnecting at the end there. I was I was looking at the contract um, at that language that you had mentioned. Um, I guess I just wanted to note that I might follow up on that with them as well. So. With the retaining teachers of color aspect, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. We're, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think that there's been any official word on it. Um, I think in general, um, we were potentially expecting that to go into effect. So I'm, I, I, yeah, I'm not going to say anything. I have no knowledge, but I, I will follow up on that. I would appreciate that. I was going to follow up after the meeting too. So, but okay. I appreciate that. Thanks, Berkeley. Absolutely. I'll keep you posted if I, if I get any information. Nice to see everybody. Berkeley. So Claire, just let me know when you want me to jump in. I know folks probably have been sitting in front of computers most of the day today, so I will try to be very brief as well. No, we we so appreciate you coming here and I will um, officially call the Family Connections meeting to order. We will start that and as people come back, please just come on back. Like I mentioned, we are recording this, so if you're, putting a kid down or eating something, you can catch the first couple minutes later recorded. Um, I am going to put the agenda into the notes. Um, we do have a couple uh, family connections um, items that we're going to do after we hear from um, Josh and from the equity committee co-chairs after Josh. Um, so please, please stick around if you're able so that we can um, address those. But I would like to introduce Josh. Josh, uh, if, if you're not familiar, we do have a lobbyist through the Minneapolis Public Schools, and that is Josh. And um, especially now with this huge budget surplus we have with the state, um, I know Josh has been very busy um, activating parents and other community members so that Minneapolis can get the, what, 40 odd million dollars that the DFL is proposing um, versus the zero that the Senate Republicans are. Um, so with that, Josh, I would love to turn it over to you to share kind of what you do and how as um, parents or community members, we can assist you. Great, thanks, Claire. And uh, I see a few familiar faces on the screen. Um, if you've been on any of my uh, Zoom meetings or in person meetings for the Parent Legislative Action Committee, can you just wave your hand? Yep, great, thank, thank you. And Mike is always good at um, pinging me on occasion uh, with some really good questions as well. So. Um, Okay, I'm Josh Downham. I have been the lobbyist for MPS since 2015. Uh, I am a graduate of Washburn High and I've had uh, two daughters, uh, one who is uh, currently at Southwest and another who graduated from Southwest. And we have uh, been very fortunate, I think, to have a really strong education for our kids. And um, I, I feel pretty lucky. I get to wake up every day and lobby for my own kids. You know, it's a pretty cool job. Um, I have I did a very short stint with the district back in the late 90s. I lobbied for them at that point. I left for 14 years and then they called me and said, do you want to come back? And I said, absolutely. And um, it's been a challenge uh, over at the Capitol. It's been a challenge at the district, especially in the last couple of years but I feel pretty good uh, about where we are um, from a legislative standpoint. One of the biggest challenges the district has, as you all know, is declining enroll enrollment. So Principal Andrews talked about uh, those budget numbers and how that works. Well, that's because the districts are funded by the number of pupils that enroll and that doesn't just affect state dollars. That affects how much we get to uh, levy for our local property taxes that folks voted for. And it affects the amount of Title I money. It affects those federal dollars as well. So year over year, MPS is actually gonna have less revenue next year than it has this year. Even though last year the legislature approved a two and a half percent increase in the general education levy or general education uh, aid formula. So the legislature said you have more money, but if you have declining enrollment, you have fewer dollars. And the real big challenge of declining enrollment is 
it's not in one grade or in one school. You lose kids here or there, high school, middle school. You still have to have all the same infrastructure, the teacher, the janitor, uh, the, you know, the um, nutrition staff, the bus driver. Losing a student here or a student there is just killer on district budget. Um, there's a very small component to the state aid formula for declining enrollment, which backfills uh, about 25% for a, for a year. Uh, <clears throat> part of what the Democrats are proposing is actually to really bump that up for this next year, uh, just for one additional year. So we would, we would actually realize several million dollars from that one component in the in the Democrats, the House Democrats bill. But before I go too far down that, I'm gonna quick share a very brief PowerPoint. And Josh, just as a point of order, if you could email this PowerPoint to me afterwards so our um, secretary can stick it in the notes, that's super helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so I don't know if you all can see that with the um, with the zoom on the side. Okay, great. I, so I, this I don't path. Know that, oh, I'm sorry. I what's that? Being real clear, but I, I have I have uh, I'm having trouble hearing. In my from my standpoint, I don't hear it clear because the uh, the voice, the sound is frozen back and forth. So, just as you know, I don't know, Claire. Can you help? I I was unable to to hear exactly what he said. I think the sound was going out for him. Oh, so okay. maybe if we just keep talking, it'll come up. I'm okay. not sure. I, I apologize if it's on my end. Uh, very briefly, I just wanted to ground us on where we are in the 2022 legislative session. Um, the It is a non-budget session, that's what they call it, because the legislature passed a two-year budget last year. <clears throat> However, as Claire mentioned, since that budget passed, the state has realized an incredibly large forecasted budget uh, surplus the largest in state history. So $9.3 billion for the, the remainder of this year. So the, the year ends on June 30th and next year. For just this, what, 17 months or so, they're projecting that we'll have $9.3 billion more than we're going to spend. They also look out two years beyond that. They call that the out biennium. And they're projecting to have a surplus of six point, I think it's 6.2 billion, which when you think about it, um, and this gets back to something that Principal Andrews was uh, getting into, the state thinks about dollars as one-time dollars, like you can spend them like it's a bank account. And if you spend that dollar, it's gone. Or ongoing revenue, and that's kind of analogous to your income. So the legislature is always trying to figure out how much of the money they have to spend is one time in nature, and they can't obligate it off into the future, and how much of it is ongoing. So when you think about that 9.3 for this biennium and the 6.2 uh, 6 in the uh, out biennium, they can actually obligate $6.2 billion of funding into the future. And when they do education funding, it's almost always ongoing funding. It's very rare that they do cliffs where they'll give it to you and then it goes away. No notable exception is uh, some pre-K stuff. But so the, the good news is the legislature has a, a ton of money. The bad news is only one of the two bodies wants to use it for K-12 education. And uh, Claire, you mentioned the, the House has about 3.3 billion over the next three years for education. And the Senate has about 32 million. 3.3 billion, 
32 million. We also have 1.15 billion of unspent federal resources from the American Rescue Plan. Uh, if those dollars do not get spent by June 15th, the governor actually gets the right to spend them how he sees fit, which is actually a pretty big lever that the Democrats have at the legislature to get Republicans to do something. Because Tim Walls get to, gets to decide how those dollars get spent if the legislature doesn't agree to do that uh, by May 23rd. And the other big thing that's really mixing up the um, environment over there is that they just got new districts. So they every 10 years with the census, they redistrict all 201 legislators. And so they're all up for re-election this year and they're all running in districts that are different than what they've done in the past. Add on top of that, that 30% of sitting incumbents were paired with one of their fellow legislators that they have to run against because they got districted into the same district. Much of that has sorted itself out like you saw uh, Jamie Long in South Minneapolis and Frank Hornstein were in the same district. Frank actually moved so that he could run in a different district. So I mentioned that the House has uh, 3.3 billion over the next three years in their education omnibus bill. Um, a huge chunk of that is in uh, to buy down the underfunding of special education. Uh, and that's almost uh, a billion and a half of their uh, funding over the next three years. They also fully fund special education, or pardon me, English learner programs. And then, as I mentioned earlier, declining enrollment. Uh, so they boost that formula for districts that are seeing uh, declines in their student populations. All three of these are really critical for Minneapolis. And we would, um, if the House bill were to pass, MPS would get $40 million for this next school year. And then um, about the same for the following year, assuming that enrollment stayed flat. Uh, the decline in enrollment aid would actually be just for one year, but the English learner funding is phased in over a number of years, so that would actually increase. The Senate Education Committee, on the other hand, put all of their money into literacy training for teachers. Um, and they feel very strongly that districts need to do a better job of training teachers right, and higher ed institutions to train teachers to teach reading. And that's all they did. So at the bottom there, you can see um, Minneapolis would receive 40 million in the House and zero in the Senate. So I'll, I'll pause there. Um, does anyone have any questions about kind of what's happening with the education bills? Gosh, I have a question about declining enrollment. Is that, I mean, I know that that's something that Minneapolis is struggling with. Is that seen like across the board with public school districts uh, all across Minnesota or not so much? It, it is, it's not, not to the same degree. So MPS has seen a pretty significant drop. I mean, I think the overall drop was only about a half percent statewide. Whereas in Minneapolis, it's, I, I can't even remember, but it's significantly higher than that. Um, you know, we have had a few major things hit MPS. The CDD had an impact. Um, the pandemic and not being in person had an impact. And then we're seeing a, a demographic shift in the city. Um, so the gentrification and the cost of apartments has really made it a challenge for lower income families to come to Minneapolis and stay. So we used to be the place where new immigrant families would come and they would, they would put down roots and they would stay. They're not even landing in Minneapolis anymore. Um, they're now going, um, so if you look at the demographic makeup of Columbia Heights, Brooklyn Center and Richfield, they're more diverse. They have more EL kids as a percent of their population. And they have more kids uh, receiving free and reduced lunch meals. 
So, and this is this phenomenon is now happening across the country where you're seeing larger urban areas, the housing costs and some of the federal changes around immigration have really changed the demographics of the of the student population. And so I I suspect our student population is going to look a lot more like um, a Hopkins or a St. Louis Park in about three or four years. We're going to be less. We're going to be less impoverished at overall in total. Um, but within that, we're going to have people with a lot of means and people with very, very few. We really are a district of kind of two cities in many ways when it comes to economics. And I really think that we're going to continue to struggle uh, if, if we don't have housing that folks can afford. Um, and then, you know, kids like my daughter, they they have zero interest in having kids, or if they do, they're going to have them into their 30s. So you're seeing declining, like we just have fewer school age children now uh, being born or, you know, in the city or being born because folks are not interested in that. So just real quickly, the finance committee, uh, the pardon me, the, the finance committees passed all their omnibus bills out this past week. The legislature is actually on break this week uh, and they will return from the Easter Passover break on Tuesday and they will have five, they will have five weeks to get everything done. Here's the crazy part. They're gonna spend another week and a half uh, passing the bills off the floor of the house and the Senate. And then they're gonna have a staring contest for about two and a half weeks. And then the last week or 10 days, there's just going to be a huge crush. When that happens, the chance of nothing getting done or getting agreed to really escalates. And since they've already passed the budget, there's nothing hanging over their heads. If they do nothing this session, they've already met their constitutional obligations. They can walk away from this session doing nothing and there are no consequences. There is a lot of concern because when you look out to the next election, um, a number of the Republicans are thinking that they have a good shot at winning the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. And they're, they're thinking, well, if, if we run the table, why would we spend and negotiate with Democrats now when we can use that money next session, 2023? We Republicans would be able to do anything we want with it because then we don't have a Tim Walls or a Melissa Hortman to have to negotiate with. So within the party, they're trying to figure out if, if they just say no to everything this year and hope that they can sweep the table um, in November. I think they have a good shot at winning the House and the Senate. And I think right now, Tim Walls is a coin flip. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of time between now and November. We don't even know who the Republican nominee is going to be. But if it's Scott Jensen and Tim Walls, I think it's going to be a coin flip. And we could have Republicans top to bottom. And then my job is going to be playing defense the entire time, it's trying to stop vouchers, trying to stop them from dividing up Minneapolis into five districts. I mean, it's going to be, it'll be crazy. Um, and then session adjourns on the 23rd. Midnight on the 22nd is the deadline for passing bills. So they will, they have to quit at that point. And then, like I said, all 201 legislators and the governor are up in, uh, um, on November 8th. So not to be a uh, Debbie Downer, but we do have some opportunities for those of you who have participated in the Parent Legislative Action Committee. Um, we we're, we're really are trying to affect change, particularly at this point with uh, Republicans in the Senate. And since no, there are zero Republicans who represent districts in Minneapolis. So we have to rely on suburban and greater Minnesota communities to do outreach to their own state senators. 
And so um, I just sent out an action alert earlier this week asking MPS parents to call friends and family who live in, a, I have a list of different communities of some of the key communities. And I'll, I'll just take a Mound, for example. There's a Senator Osmek out there who's gonna have a really tough reelection. And he needs to hear from people in the Minnetonka, Mound, Shorewood, St. Bonnie area that special education, English learner funding is critical to those districts out there. So if you have friends and family who reside in that area, we're asking MPS parents to do a little outreach to those folks. Give him, give them uh, Senator Osmek's contact information and then um, have them call. Because if Kate or her Emmy calls a de uh, you know, Dennis Osmek, he's not gonna give you the time of day. And in fact, it's, it's not worth your energy at all. Uh, it's really about activating parents in these other communities. So I'm also working with a, a group, uh, a kind of a coalition of uh, largely special education groups like PACER, if you're familiar with PACER, um, the Legal Services Advocacy Project, a Multicultural Autism Awareness uh, folks, they have put together the parents together. And uh, on Monday at 6 p.m., they're going to be doing an education and advocacy night for parents to teach parents across the state how to get involved uh, effectively at the state capitol. Uh, it's a one hour session. You're gonna hear more about kind of the underfunding of special education, what that means, how do, how do you get, wrap your head about around that? At the capitol, it's called the cross subsidy, the special education cross subsidy. In Minneapolis, we refer to it as the underfunding of special education because many of our special ed parents have said cross subsidy pits parents against parents. So we've moved away from that. And um, this group will then give you some concrete steps and even like um, uh, a sample letter that you can help work with your friends and family uh, in different communities. And I think they've targeted about 12 state senators, I think. So um, there's plenty of communities in greater Minnesota and the suburban, suburban communities where we can do some targeted outreach. So this Facebook link will bring you to their, back, just a brief um, description with a link to a Zoom event where you can register. And again, it's Monday at 6 p.m. And I would encourage those of you who are not part of the Parent Legislative Action Committee, I would love to have you be on my mailing list. I send out um, updates from the Capitol and I send out action alerts. This year, a little bit more than typical year, but usually in a legislative session, I put out a, about a once a month an update and then action alerts about every six weeks. This year, the because it's a shorter legislative session and there's been a lot happening, We've been hitting a few more this year and we'll even have an, an, at least one more. And there's the potential of this Parents Together group actually doing a day on the Hill where parents can come to the Capitol and advocate face-to-face uh, -face with lawmakers. So I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions. Josh, could you back up a bit um, and, and discuss what you're saying about if there's no agreement on the CARES Act money that Walls just decides? Yeah, so um, coming out of the 2021 legislative session, you know, the state had, I, I want, Mike, I want to say it was around close to 3 billion that they were able to allocate. Um, and they only allocated two of the 3 billion. And they decided kind of from a strategic strategic standpoint, we don't know what's going to happen with the virus. Why don't we sit on 1.1 billion of it so we could allocate it during the 2022 session? Um, but the governor said, well, if you guys don't agree to it, 
I want to be able to push those dollars out. Uh, and so they negotiated that the governor gets sole discretion over how those dollars are spent if no uh, agreement is reached. Okay, that makes sense. Josh, do you want to put your um, email in the chat? So if anybody wants to get a hold of you um, to reach out to either join the legislative action committee or has follow up questions, they can connect with you. Happy to. Um, you may also get an email from me, uh, downham at gmail. I'm actually not a school district employee. I'm a contractor. Uh, and so I usually, I, well, I office out of this wonderful South Minneapolis little room here, um, but I send emails both on my MPS account and my Gmail account. Do you have a preference for which email people should contact you at? Um, I've gotten pretty good at re reading both, but I usually use my Gmail just because it's uh, front and center on all my devices. But no, I. Um, I, I get alerts with both, so it works out just fine. The, um, the district's email system deletes emails after 90 days, which is a little, uh, for, so I like having the, the history. So Gmail works better so I can go back and find things and, but. And Outlook's a little bit of an antiquated system too. Oh Let's my! Just mention that as well. Yes, it is. So I, I'm curious: is this group the PTA that also does a family connections kind of after meeting? Is that what what this is? So family connections is a PTO, right. um, and uh, we call it family connections at Mercy because it's a little bit more inclusive because not all adult caregivers are parents. Well, would love to have those of you who uh, are not signed up for uh, the Parent Legislative Action Committee to do so, just drop me a note. I will add you to the, the email list. Um, and then if at any point, you say, you know, this isn't for me. I'll happily remove you from the list. I've had a couple of parents whose kids aged out. And when I kick off the list the next year, they're like, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> so um, it, I've got a senior this year, but um, I will be very happily. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys uh, are familiar with a group called Parents United. It was very active at the state capitol from like 2006 or seven through 2016. It brought parent voice from across the state to the capitol. But what the other thing it did is it taught parents how to really use their time efficiently to lobby. And that group dissolved in 2016 because they were reliant on you know, foundation funding, and one of the big foundations decided to move their money elsewhere. Um, so we've lost really that, um, it, you know, lawmakers don't necessarily want to hear from paid lobbyists like me. They want to hear from real people. They want to hear from students, and they want to hear from parents. And Parents United filled that role very well. So, um, I've had a couple of conversations with some, uh, with a couple of different foundations, and the hope would be that we try to reconstitute some aspects of Parents United um, using some technology to connect folks. But it's going to take people and time to manage all of the information and push those things out and keep you know, do some of that educating of parents around the state. 
So um, stay tuned, but I'm, I'm hopeful that after like in June of this year, we'll be able to kick off something formally with some foundation money behind it. Just a quick note, I was looking on the uh, Minneapolis page and it just says to email you to get information, which seems like it feels like an intrusive way to reach out and contact to get this information. If you wanted to encourage people to sign up more, a form would feel more standard for signing up for a newsletter, if that's at all possible. Happy to do it. Because that's, I think a lot of people are more used to that and, and feel some hesitancy about directly emailing someone to get this information instead of just, you click on the link, you fill out your information, then you're on the mailing list. It makes it a bit more streamlined. No, I'm happy to do that. I. Um... We have, you know, the set, the, maybe one of the only positive things that, um, well, I, I'll just not say that. I, one of the positive things that came out of the strike was that uh, I almost doubled the, the number of parents who signed up to be on the Parent Legislative Action Committee. Um, it's unfortunate that it took a strike, but I was really excited that there is a lot of energy among MPS parents. Uh, to fix what's happening here. Uh, we don't want to lose those strong teachers. They do deserve more money, but they're finite resources. And uh, as Principal Andrews was saying, when you pay someone more and you still only have a certain amount of money, you're going to have fewer people. And we have about, we're at about right around 80, 85% of our costs uh, of our operating budget are people. So when you have when you have to cut five percent, there's only so much toner cartridge and printers and those things that you can get rid of. Ultimately, the big cost is in people, and um, that's where we have to get more resources from the state, especially around special ed, where we're underfunded to the tune of fifty million dollars a year. Especially all those high salary admin people at Davis, right? <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I guess I'm one of them. I, my apologies, I didn't realize I had my video off. Um, you know, I think it's really important to do in, I read some of those comments in the Star Tribune uh, yesterday about Davis Center and the number of people who um, have high salaries. I would really encourage you to look, like compare districts to districts, like how much do they spend on administration as a percent of budget? Minneapolis runs a very lean ship relative to other districts. That's not to say we can't do better, but it's not as if Minneapolis is just pouring money into admin. Um, so I, I would take issue with that. All right. Well, fabulous. Josh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, we really appreciate you coming and chatting with us um, and sharing all this information and, and ways for people to, to get motivated. Well, thank and thanks for all, all of you who have actually done some of that outreach. That's going to be so critical in these last five weeks of session. And please um, reach out and Ever, I will get that form up on the, the page uh, tomorrow. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Josh. All right. We have a second presentation this evening. We have Hannah and Jessica, who are, <clears throat> excuse me, the co chairs of the equity committee at Minneapolis or at Marcy. Not, not all of Minneapolis. I mean, you could be, I guess, but just at Marcy, you're the co-chairs of the equity committee. And we are so thankful for you coming and sharing your information with us. Um, we had a couple, we have a couple of um, parents who are very interested, but we're unable to attend tonight. So we're recording so we can, as we do share um, for anyone who's not able to, to be here right now. Um, and so we would love to hear more about what the equity what the equity committee does and more importantly what we as family connections to do what we as family connections can do to support you it has been a long day 
please take it away, my friends. Thanks for having us. Um, we're really excited to be here with you. Um, Hannah's gonna drive us through. All right, we just have some um, slides here to kind of guide our conversation, but we really do want it to be um, more of a conversation um, than a presentation. So, but we'll start by giving you a little bit of background information. Um, First of all, I am Jess Driscoll. Um, I'm new to Marcy as of uh, January, and um, I've been in Minneapolis public schools since uh, 2014 um, and taught for 14 years prior to that, um, but I've been in um, various coaching and leadership roles. My role at Marcy is a differentiation specialist and an instructional specialist and um, point two of my time is also supporting um, math instruction um, for uh, K-5. So, and my partner, Hannah, will introduce herself now. Hi everyone, I'm Hannah Edwards. My pronouns are she, her. Um, this is my second year in Minneapolis and at Mercy. Um, I'm the Arts Magnet Coordinator, and so um, technically my job is to help oversee all of our Arts Magnet programming. I've been doing a lot of uh, building subbing this school year, though, and so I've gotten to know many of your students, I'm sure, on a first-name basis, which um, that's the silver lining, is getting to work with all of uh, your young folks. They're pretty great. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and get started on our little presentation we have here. Um, so um, at the beginning of the year, we did have um, a position originally um, to lead the SEL equity work at Marcy, a, a building TOSA. Um, because of numbers and enrollment, that position was moved to help support online school as a classroom teacher. Um, and that's kind of when I stepped in to help co-lead equity as a, a passion of mine and so I thought hey rather than put this on the teacher's plates I can uh, try and help out with um, leading the equity team and then when Jess came on it was a natural fit for her to co-lead with me um, so yeah so the the purpose though of our kind of like our mission statement right is to examine school-wide practices and systems um, through that equity and SEL lens really looking at everything we do at Marcy um, and how equity and SEL work can help um, promote student success and ensure that there are positive outcomes for all of our learners, um, no matter their background, no matter um, any, anything, right? Um, one thing that we're working on is helping to organize family involvement. Um, and that can look like events, like the district-led days, um, which is Naf National African American Parent Involvement Day. But what we're really hoping is that, especially as COVID is opening up and hopefully dying down, um, we can have more family involvement events um, that are not necessarily district, but more so Marcy specific. Um, and that really represent the families that we have at Marcy. Um, so like I said, this year we started and then it kind of stopped for a second. And then um, we came back together as an SEL equity team. And one of the first things that I helped us in doing um, in order to ensure that we start building some of these other celebrations and events was to develop a year long calendar um, that we share with the staff, but especially focus on as an equity team. Um, and the calendar has resources um, for teachers, and it highlights different important times of recognition throughout the year, such as, um, you know, um, religious holidays, um, cultural holidays, um, months of recognition, such as Black History Month. Um, and that kind of was where Jess came in. She came in right before our Black History Month work. I'm going to let you go ahead, Jess, and take over the rest of this slide. Sure. And I appreciate, um, I noticed Emmy putting in. Um, a definition for our SEL. Um, I appreciate, we know that um, Minneapolis uses a lot of acronyms. So uh, we apologize for not um, 
spelling that out. And we appreciate that you put that in there for the rest of us. So SEL is social emotional learning. Um, one of the things, so I came on board and I was only half time at Marcy in um, January and February. Um, but one of the things that was incredibly successful in my previous role, I was, um, I was an admin TOSA at uh, Pillsbury, another Northeast school. Um, we, um, we launched a uh, Black Lives Matter at school um, week last year at Pillsbury. It was incredibly successful. So that was uh, an idea that we discussed at Marcy. And of course, we had um, you know just tremendous enthusiasm for it. So we um, recognized Black Lives Matter at Marcy school-wide. Um, it's a week of learning. And really they have, um, they have a lot of resources and curriculum to use. So we really capitalized on that and also um, looked at those 13 guiding principles and um, made it fit with our uh, Marcy students. So that was um, in February that we did that. And then we also, um, during Black History Month, the equity team, equity and SEL team, uh, put together a celebration of Black excellence um, that we really wanted because, because of COVID, because we're so isolated um, from each other and it's really hard to get together to do um, school-wide sorts of community learning and um, activities. We wanted a shared experience for all of our students. So we developed some um, videos that were highlighting black excellence in the arts. And those videos were um, shared with each classroom, um, pre-K through five, and they would um, show the video and have some conversations around the people that were being celebrated in each video. And so that was a really cool shared um, experience for our students without actually being in a shared space. Um, we also created a Black Excellence Gallery. So each classroom put together a large visual of um, a somebody that they were recognizing um, for demonstrating Black excellence. And um, the class put together a large poster. Those are displayed in the first floor hallway. We wanted them displayed where everybody could see them. So they are on their way to various center classrooms. And um, that was a really exciting thing. And that kind of launches us into where we're going. Um, so the strike happened, um, which really kind of put us back in what our plan was. And that was to be sharing that culmination of that experience with families. And um, so we're working on that right now. So you will be seeing that soon um, because we know that with limitations of having lots of people come into the building, um, we want you to be able to see the amazing work that each class put together. So a video will be, uh, we're working on creating a video right now. That video will be shared with you all so that you can see um, all of the amazing things that each of the classrooms brought to that Black Excellence Gallery. Yeah, and um, just before we move on from this, I'm loving seeing in the chat that your kids are coming home um, and talking about this project because that means that it was meaningful and it achieved what we had hoped. I feel like a lot of times Black history um, doesn't focus on um, all the positive contributions. It can very easily um, go into stereotypes and tropes. And so it's lovely to have some of that joy and excellence um, be something that the kids bring home and are excited about. That's like my personal biggest hope. So it's really affirming to hear that your kids are talking about it. And I can't wait for us to be able to share this video with you. Um, another kind of where we're going, um, I actually just met and kind of finalized so you all get to be some of the first people to hear, but we're having, um, 
some uh, gender equity PD and it's being led, um, Claire's happy about that, right? Yeah, um, so the gender equity PD is actually being led by gender inclusive schools, um, which is um, full disclosure, a company that my husband uh, works for. I have a transgender child and so Inadvertently, he's kind of become an expert throughout the nation, honestly, leading some of this work. And when we sat down as district people, I sat with me and um, Ann Viveros and Roy Kawai, and we tried to reinvent the wheel. And even myself having a transgender child, being married to a husband who does this, I was like, why am I trying to reinvent something that someone does um, professionally? <laughs> So we decided and have, um, are waiting for a quote from Dave, and then we'll put them on the calendar in the next few weeks here um, for the staff to have some gender equity and gender inclusion uh, professional development. Um, and as an S SEL equity team, we're hoping that that kind of sets us up um, for June. And we figured since we're in school for June, we might do something similar to what we did with our Black Excellence posters and do, um, kind of, you know, some LGBTQ history and excellence with our students, um, where we highlight some of the same things, maybe through the arts, since we're an art school, um, LGBTQ excellence throughout history in the arts, um, and then the broader scope being another sort of poster project. Um, and, you know, this is an early talks, but it's going to be nice outside, so maybe um, it looks like some sort of a sharing of what makes you proud, right? Um, pride is a Marcy motto, and so I feel like it all is in the works right now, but it's going to come together and be really a cool opportunity. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a little bit of kind of what we're, we're heading towards as we um, end the year. And then we just have a couple of wonderings for you all, but Jess, you were the one at the last meeting, and so I'm going to let you go ahead and take this slide, too. Yes, so we um, brought to our team um, the, the possibility of really partnering more um, with our families around this work. And, um, you know, I think that we could be really great, um, great assets to each other. So one of the wonderings that came up when we discussed this was um, we know that language is often a barrier when we connect with families. We know that it's been um, a frustration that's been brought by families to us that there aren't um, always necessarily uh, things at home in various languages. Um, so we know that that's a big issue. Um, we also know that in different um, different events, different committees, um, for instance, like this um, group of families, we want to make sure that we're honoring um, and including um, various uh, language speakers uh, because we know that that can be a barrier that is an immediate um, turnoff and can can really like exclude some people who have some incredibly valuable insight for us. So one of the wonderings that we had as a team was that how can we address this together? Um, if that means having, you know, and we kind of brainstorm some things, but having um, possibly some affinity groups, having some um, sort of family representative hubs where um, maybe if families were feeling um, that they needed some questions answered, if maybe they could come to representatives from this team, um, sort of as like a network or reach out person um, to collaborate and connect there. Um, and then also just making sure that we have um, appropriate translations in both writing and uh, when we come together as a community um, now and as we ease up with our COVID restrictions and hopefully we can get together more in person, it would be great to um, really put our heads together and make some really amazing things happen um, throughout various languages. And then we'd also love to hear about this group, about Family Connections Dreams and Ideas, 
so that we can really have like a symbiotic relationship with you all um, and, and work together to, to do some really amazing things. Um, we know that this year has been wonky the last year um, as well, the last few years. Um, and so we really wanna be intentional and um, forward thinking um, about how we can do some really powerful, impactful things for our families, our students, um, and our community. So we'd love to hear any ideas that you all have um, and love to hear about your dreams and ideas for this group. I love the idea of language. It was actually just brought up on the um, Integrated Schools Minneapolis Facebook page. Um, a different, a PTO at a different school had um, actually asked their translator to share um, like a, a welcoming greeting um, phrase um, and some other um, language tidbits, I think in Somali, but it would be great to have it in Somali and Spanish. And if there's another kind of third um, language that has a large usage at Marcy, um, that would be, that'd be great. And like our May or June meetings, I would love that. Yeah, just chiming in because um, Claire and I have been having some wanderings together as well about um, interpretation. We've been um, lucky enough to have both Susanna and Anissa with us during these meetings, um, but I've noticed that there isn't any interpretation actually happening. And I think that it goes both ways, right? Perhaps there was a time, some of the meetings where no one needed that, but at the same time, I think people will come if we're providing that. Um, so I think if we can, that's just one avenue of inclusivity in terms of language, if we can be consistent about providing that interpretation, then I think that will draw people in as well. And just in general, in terms of, I would love to see more connections with um, our group and your equity committee. I think that sounds um, really beautiful in terms of, of what we could, um, what that could look like. I think like with the Black Excellence Month, um, I think the more that families see themselves represented at school, the more that we can create that cohesion. And obviously, like we've said with the pandemic, it's, you know, things have been harder to make connections and build relationships, but um, I think there's, there's a lot, yeah, that we can do there. Well, I love the idea too of affinity groups um, and certainly, certainly for the families, but I think what, what I would be more interested in is seeing affinity groups for the kiddos themselves, right? Because I feel like that's something that could be more easily implemented, like Tuesday at such and such time in the middle of the day for like all third through fifth graders, right? Or, or whatever, um, um, because I think that sometimes adults get in the way of kids forming bonds with each other. And if we can kind of cross pollinate between grades and um, um, classes within a grade so that kiddos can get to know each other, that that's a huge step forward. So um, anything family connections to do can help with, especially for the affinity groups for the kids, I would love to see. That's a really great idea, Claire. Um, I think that both Hannah and I will be excited to bring that idea to our equity SEL team. Um, you know, even Hannah and I were talking today about the, the importance of kids um, seeing people um, that, that may be like them, um, adults that may be like them. And we've been so isolated in our silos because of COVID that I think we've had such minimal interactions, not only in schools, but in, you know, in our world in general. So um, I think that's a really great idea to start, um, you know, bridging those gaps, making those connections, building those relationships between various grade levels um, and allowing that opportunity for our students to get to know each other and talk about what's important 
to them, what's significant to them, because you're right. Adults are often the ones that get in the way. And, you know, as, as we were talking to, and Emmy, you mentioned, you know, kind of knowing um, what's happening and what's going on, you know, perhaps something even as simple as, um, you know, a representative from our committee joining a meeting, um, you know, every so often so that we can provide those updates. And even, you know, if we have some areas that we need or, or would appreciate some insight or just like almost a thinking partner um, with you all as we plan um, for future events. Maybe that's something that we could uh, think about is keeping some sort of um, periodic standing time on, uh, on the calendar with these meetings. So just that. second Thursday of every month at seven o'clock, you're welcome to come to all of them. Okay. Well, so that's what I was saying, a once a month meeting. I don't want to take all of your time, right? right? But I do think if we, even if we check in every other time and we say, here's our calendar, here's what we have coming up, here's what we're planning, that way we can get parent input. Um, I hope too with COVID hopefully dying down and things opening back up, I would love as we're planning these events, if a parent says, hey, this is our family and we would love to share whether that's a presentation or an art project or just simply coming in and talking with your child's class. I mean, I'm just really hopeful that we can start making some of those natural connections again. Yeah, I think that's really meaningful. Like I was just thinking back to December, my daughter's in kindergarten and we're Jewish and um, our teacher knows that. And she asked if we wanted to, um, about read if we had recommendations for books she could read about Hanukkah and if Lily wanted to bring anything in and share and um, I think you know yeah forming those relationships with families and um, is really huge and can bring a lot of celebration into the classroom and a lot of not recognition in the terms of but you know um, yeah just honoring their culture. I, would, I was going to ask a question too. You had mentioned doing possibly doing an in-person event in June, um, and I was going to bring up with this committee anyway. If there was going to be a, if we were going to do any kind of spring event, um, so that's something that that yeah we'd love to as it gets fleshed out. Would love to hear more about or help plan or um, keep us updated. Is there a traditional spring event that used to be held at Marcy Art School pre-pandemic? That's before my time, so. I think the plant the sale. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Hannah, Hannah has to go. Hannah, thank you so much for coming. We appreciate. I am always open to emails and questions. You can always email me. I will answer as soon as possible. So I'd love to hear from you all at any point. Um, hi, this is the first time I've been at one of these meetings. Um, I actually do have something to talk about, but I do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Um, would you rather me send like an email I could send to both Jessica and Hannah specifically for the equity team? I'm here to listen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think this is a perfect time for you to ask your question. A hundred percent. You are okay, okay sharing it publicly. If you'd like to do it privately, then by all means. No, 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 that's fine. I just didn't want to um, make anyone feel like they had to stay on because I know we're at eight o'clock now. Um, I was just wondering um, what kind of policies, like what kind of school policies you were going to look into like with an equity lens? Is it just kind of that gender inclusive language and some of those other things that you guys were talking about? Or are there other policies you're thinking of? So our plan is to look at um, all of our policies and really look at um, what, you know, our policies can easily have language that can be uh, 
exclusive um, without it being intentional. It can also be, you know, policies are written so in such a formal technical manner. And we really want to make sure that our policies um, you know, and a lot of times we're we're not even aware of what our policies say, right? But we're expected to abide by them. So we really want to be intentional and aware um, of what each and every one of our policies says and how that impacts um, our students. So the and we haven't started this yet, and that's kind of why it landed on the where we're going. But we'd like to um, have uh, part of our meeting. Um, every time we meet, we, we meet every other week. Um, we alternate with uh, ILT, our instructional leadership team. Um, we would like to look at policies each time and just sort of interrogate them and make sure that we are, um, you know, that we are ensuring that it is, um, that they are productive and not harmful to any one of our students. Because um, sometimes we can adopt policies that, that we might not be specifically looking at it through an equity lens or through a social emotional lens. Um, and so we just wanna make sure that we are very cognizant of the language and that everybody has a clear understanding. Um, and if it's a policy that does not fit with, with Marcy, then we want to bring that to administration. Um, we want to bring that forth to staff and to families and talk about um, how we might go about either adjusting, modifying, or removing um, policies that may not serve us. Does that help answer your question? Yeah, that does. I actually have something that I want to put forward then. Um, I sure. really would like it if um, we could look into like the disciplinary policies. Sure. I feel like Marcy uses suspensions inappropriately. I don't think we should be using suspensions for elementary school kids. And I think that it is biased towards our kids of color. I was actually looking up some data out of the state of education just today. Um, my son is actually... Um, I'm feeling a little emotional. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. He is a kid of color and he actually um, was suspended today. And this has been like one, give me just a second, okay? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think surprisingly, the district shows like historical data for discipline, which I was surprised a couple of years ago, I realized that they did this and I was surprised that there's as much transparency as there was. But if you look at that link that I put in, Marcy is consistently at the top of the list for disciplinary actions against students. And considering, you know, the rest of the like 10 or so above us are primarily high schools. Um, I think it's really surprising that as an elementary school, we'd be so high on the list. Not well, surprising, disappointing. Absolutely disappointing. Absolutely. And um, in, it needs to change. That's, it's unacceptable. And it looks like this was just updated too. So no one can fall on the, oh, this is old data. That's not how it is now. Um, right. Oh my goodness. Um, well, I think that that's critical data to bring forth and share with, um, with our equity team. Um, and also if, you know, as, as an equity team, we can talk about, um, you know, action steps to address it because this isn't something that we can just, um, you know, wait and see, we, this is, this needs to be acted upon now it's not okay um you know at well, also says we have 716 students which i don't think marcy has so that makes me wonder if our percentage is higher if 26 out of 716 oh right like we have like 540 students at marcy. yeah we got right so that would that would like 
bumps up make, your son. Make it get worse. Jeez. <sighs> boy, oh boy. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, and I know I had asked at an earlier meeting about the kind of why it had been removed as one of our SIP goals. And there was some discussion about how last year's school year kind of made it difficult to, to track on suspension since so many kids were like out of, you know, it was distance learning for so long. And so, it's, you know, disciplinary actions looked different last year, but I think now seeing as Claire pointed out, like that the data has been updated and it's not, it's not different, it's not better. Like mm -hmm. I would push back against that kind of like a narrative of, oh, well, you know, distance learning meant that we didn't really have disciplinary issues, you know? 100%, yeah, yeah. Um, that is, it is really troubling and it, you know, it sounds like, um, these are things that, you know, need to be moved to the immediate, not just with, you know, our equity team, um, but, you know, we, we have to do better. We, there is no reason that we should not be, that we should have such dis disproportionality in, um, in our discipline. I, you know, the thing is too, is that we have, we have resources and we have supports within the district. When I was at Pillsbury, we worked very closely. At that point, it was the Office of Black Male Student Achievement. Um, and we had some incredible programs um, for students, you know, really grounding and engaging um, specifically our brown and black boys in um, in school and um, ensuring that our teachers were supporting our students um, so that they could be successful at school. Um, so, you know, we have resources that we can lean into. Well, I, I wonder too, if we can ask, like, I'm just looking and um, Anishinaabe Academy, they mm -hmm. suspended two students, two, two total. Mm -hmm. And so like, um, yeah. I, I'm just, I'm wondering, you know, they're doing something different than Marcy is doing. And uh -huh. what can we, what can we learn yep. from what they're doing that we're not? That's a great point. Um, and I've been to Anishinaabe and it is, it is not an easy place to teach. And so the fact that there are only two is remarkable. So you're right that I think looking at who is, who, who is having some success and, and trying to figure out what they're doing and, um, and see what what we're not doing because clearly there's ugh, I'm like at a loss for words because I'm just really sad to see this and Abigail do you go by Abigail or Abby Abby's fine Abby I know I come up as Abigail I guess that's fine too <laughs> I really appreciate you bringing this and I think that this is the perfect place um, to bring that forward, um, that is huge. Um, and, you know, we, there's only six of us here right now, and I can only imagine how many other parents are sharing your same frustrations. I appreciate that. It feels good that to have my concerns validated. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I think it would be for folks that weren't here a couple of years ago, I think it was, it was either three or four years ago. Well, it was when I, my can, three years ago, Family Connections did have a, um, like a, 
basically got like a circle at one of our um, meetings where we brought in someone from the um, Minneapolis Public Schools Equity Department to talk about kind of specifically disciplinary uh, disparities in the district and at Marcy. And, and there was a maybe like 20 to 30 parents at that meeting. Um, and, you know, there were teachers and um, school leadership there as well that participated in the discussion. And it was really, it was a really open discussion. And there were definitely families there that shared similar experiences of like, this is a very concrete example of how my child of color is impacted by the, um, by the, the disparities at, at Marcy. So I think like circling back to that, this hasn't gone away, that this discussion is still as, as important as it was a couple of years ago. And the, the fact that we haven't really like changed anything yeah. since those two or three years. Um, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, one of the, one of the things that, you know, I would for 14 years be working outside of the district. Um, one of the things that really um, was frustrating to me coming into the district is that there was a lot of talk about equity, but I never saw a lot of action. Um, and so when that when that just exists in, in conversations and we don't really see those practices coming to life within our schools, um, we're wasting precious time with our students. And so I think that it's really good to, you know, to bring back those conversations and then to always create action steps, you know, because we can't, we can't afford to spend, you know, to wait until our, you know, this group meets, you know, like, next month to say, okay, now, you know, what conversations have happened since then? It's like, this is imperative that we move on this now. So what are our next action steps? <laughs> yes, that's great. So I will be immediately um, bringing this to our equity team. Um, we will prioritize looking at our discipline policies um, and we need to, we need to dig into that data because I think that the, that's going to speak volumes to, um, not only our staff, but also administration that this needs to change. And so as we are, you know, even this morning when I, um, I ran into Trinity in the hallway and I said, oh my gosh, I'm having so many wonderful ideas for um, professional development, like year long professional development that we can engage our staff in next year. And, you know, to me, this is crying out that this is top priority. I think that as, you know, with the CDD happening, there was so much put into um, PD around the arts which is very important and arts integration, which is very important. But this is, this is something that we cannot wait on. Um, well, or heck, we have more than two months left of the school year now. Yeah. Yes, you know, exactly. No need to wait for a PD for September. No, and yeah, exactly. But, you know, I'm thinking, um, you know, as, as we're looking forward, too, I mean, we know that we need to get moving on this right now. One of the things that I really wanted to bring um, to the staff of Marcy is something that um, we were, I was working on with the staff at Pillsbury um, was Ibram Kendi's book, How to Be Anti-Racist. And, um, you know, now there's also this uh, like conversation pack that he's put together to go along with that book. And it sounds like we need to truly invest in um, developing an anti-racist staff because that disproportionality is appalling and disturbing um, and indicates to me that there are clearly racist practices happening. Well, and he has another book coming out, I think, in June, How to Raise an Anti-Racist. 
Yes. Something yes. for caregivers. So too. I'm looking at this data drop that it uh, was just dropped into the chat. Thank you, Kate. Um, is there still a student support team meeting weekly to review suspension referral data? Like, is that, are they still even looking at it like that? Not that I'm aware of. Because that seems like it would be a good thing to encourage uh, reinstating. And I don't know, did it just go poof during the pandemic and nobody brought it back? Um, that's a question that we maybe need to ask administration. I think that's a great question to ask. And, um... and who will be the contact person on asking that? Because I'm not sure. Me. Well, I, oh, good yeah, job. Yes, a hundred percent. Um, yeah, because the first thing is who's who's paying attention to this at exactly, all? Exactly, exactly. Um, and not, I mean, and just overall suspensions. Not, I mean, is anyone even paying attention to that? Let alone breaking it down farther. Mm -hmm. Well, and even looking at restorative, you know, when it talks in here about restorative practices, suspension is not a restorative practice at all. No, and in, in so. my personal experience, there was a moment when I was told that my daughter and another child were going to do some restorative uh, practice, and then it got postponed because of something, and I've asked my daughter, and apparently just, just never happened, mm -hmm. so there might be some lack of follow-through going on with that. I don't know. Yep. Yeah. I've also heard that there's a lot more disruption this year since kids came back from the pandemic. And I'm certainly see that in my own family. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that, that that's something that we need to also take into consideration is um, the mental health supports that we have in place for our students. Um, and just looking at, you know, even going back to what Claire was talking about, these affinity groups and having like th these opportunities for students to connect with each other and, um, you know, just really taking into account that, um, that we've had three years of incredible disruption in so many areas. Um, you know, I think, one of the one of the frustrations I have is that we continually talked that you know okay when we go back we're not going to go back to the way things were because the way things were weren't working and now I feel this immense pressure um, from the district to be back to back to normal you know like we've got to make up for learning loss we've got to you know do all of these things that and, and get back to where we were when we swore we wouldn't do that. We swore we'd do things differently. And so we have to look at creating space for some autonomy that we can have as a magnet site um, and also to do what we know is best for our students. Um, Sorry, I've been digging in my emails to try to find the like past sips just for context for folks. No, this is good. But you'll see like, so this year it was decreased from 77% to 60%. And then the next year it was just changed to decrease from 85% to 75%. Yeah. And then this year it's just gone. Yeah, and I'm reading this too, culturally responsive teaching in the brain. We did an immense amount of work with Zaretta Hammond at Pillsbury. I've not seen any evidence of that happening at Marcy. And I know that there's a lot of stuff going on. And because I was only half time in January and February, and I'm now full time post strike, maybe I'm missing it. Um, but it's not something that I've um, seen or heard evidence of. So. Um, and it is, it is brilliant work that can, that, that truly changes the way, um, we interact and engage with and instruct our students. So. Kate, hey, can you explain the percentages? Yeah. So it's, it's talking about how 
the that 70 that 77 or whatever percentage number is like the percentage above like it's it's the disparity percentage right like it's set like stu black oh, okay. students are 77 percent more represented more than like they they represent 77 percent of the like disciplinary gotcha actions even though they're not 77 percent gotcha. of the population Gotcha. Yeah, Thanks. it's not saying seventy-seven percent of kids are being suspended. Right. No. <laughs> I figured that, that was the case. case <laughs> like, more parents would have an issue with it. Right. The it the, the goal supposedly with the SIP plan was like to decrease the percentage of the of the suspensions that were like Im, Im, implemented upon right. students of color from like currently whatever it was 85 percent of you know the disciplinary infractions were whatever however you want to say it like mm -hmm. <sighs> this is really this is really upsetting data um but a call for action so um you know, and and as it was asked, I my action steps is to immediately take this to our equity team um, to look at this data, to look at previous SIP goals, um, and to really interrogate why we are not. You know, why did we abandon that? That is, um, you know, clearly we weren't improving. Right. Um, so, you know, we hadn't arrived at anything. Um, this seems to also be this kind of uh, suspension and discipline policy seems to come from the principal's office. Is this something that we should ask to be considered as perhaps one of the questions when we're considering a new principal? Yes, that's a great idea. So Claire, I believe you are going to be in the room on that one. Maybe that's something to add in on that list. And then um, it's fairly early in the year that new SIP goals are drafted. Is that correct? I'm trying to remember when they when they pop up. It's it's like the October site council meeting or November maybe. Okay. So the first couple of months after school will be starts. So maybe put a put a little note for the next parent council meeting that happened before then to make sure that some consideration is at least given to this for the SIP goals. Yeah, and I will say, you know, having previously been a part of, um, of developing those at Pillsbury, we actually would develop them um, in August and then discuss it with our instructional leadership team and our equity team um as soon as the school year started so that we could you know and really that those should be guiding um what we do as a staff what our priorities are for our staff development um for our you know one of the things that uh, one part of my job is uh teacher observations so that would be you know like when I go into a classroom these are particular look for's these are the particular things that we need to see happening um, and, and that should be correlated to that school improvement plan too, um, because it really is adult practices that impact outcomes for students is, is the way that school improvement plan should go. And then we have quarterly reviews. So, um, you know, by quarter one, we should already be seeing um, practices in place and seeing some momentum building um, so that we can meet the goal, you know, by June. Um, yeah. And I know in the past, um, Donna and Trinity have, they've presented the SIP plan at the beginning of the year. And then like, I think you said the last meeting of the year, they've presented like, you know, updates or progress or whatever. So maybe we could check in with them and see if that's something they're planning for the site council meeting in mm -hmm. either May or June. Yep. And have you all done, like had the state of the schools address? Does that happen? 
Okay. Okay. I don't think suspensions were mentioned at the last one. No, I'm trying to find the our current. I can't find it on the website. Maybe it's not. It's supposed to be on everybody's website, but I can't find it on our website. Um, yeah. No, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, the two there's only two goals on, on this year's SIP plan for Marcy, and they were just around. Oh, not just. They're around math and reading. Yeah, I mean, personally, I would love to see a student engagement goal, you know, how much, um, how engaged are our students and that not only means like physically engaged and, and physically present, um, but also their growth um, mm -hmm. academically. Um, there might have been actually another thing about there might have been like an SEL one, but it was it was more vague in language. But again, we should have the <laughs> plan. <laughs> yes, yes, a hundred percent. Okay. Um, yeah, I have written down. I was looking back at notes. I wrote that the number one goal was to reduce, well, what I would call the opportunity gap that they said the, yeah, to reduce the achievement gap. And obviously if you're having kids not in class, that's a big factor. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think that we have a quorum to <laughs> vote on the minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and the other stuff that we needed to do, but that's okay. We can just vote on them next time. Okay. Um, uh, I do just want to bring up one thing um, since it's 834, and that is um, Educator Appreciation Week is May 2nd through 4th. So before our next meeting, um, Sydney is going to order lunch for the staff um, like we did last year. And we're gonna um, see if uh, families can donate drinks and desserts for the boxed lunches. Um, last year, Kate and I wrote notes to all the staff saying, thank you, we appreciate you, you're wonderful. Um, I know several staff said, oh, that was so lovely. Um, <laughs> So I don't know if we want to do something like that again this year. Um, it took time, but it didn't really take time at the same time. So just cramp fingers. That was all. Yeah. Embarrassing handwriting after like <laughs> a little bit. I only spelled appreciate wrong, like on half <laughs> of them. It's fine. But if anyone had anything else that they wanted um, to share with, with that, or with anything else that you wanted to bring up. Oh, yes. And Jess, I was going to say, could you drop your email in the chat? I know we can find um, some emails on the website, although not everyone's email is on the website. Um, so thank you for doing that so we can stay connected. Absolutely. Um, and I will. Um, Claire, if it's okay with you, um, I can email, because I know that that time is of the essence, I can email um, some things that, you know, when I bring um, this information up to the equity team, um, email some, um, some thoughts and some action steps of, of what we are thinking that we might do on our end. I think it was a great suggestion. Um, questions for the new principal around this. Um, I think that's great too, but um, yeah, I think we, I think we need to be diligent. And when we talked about the ways that we can partner together, I think this is a huge one. Um, and a lot of times there are things that happen that might not um, be on everyone's radar, but this, I really appreciate Abby, you bringing this forth. Um, because it very clearly is a concern of others as well. 
Yeah, no problem. And I'm happy that I came to this meeting. So I hope everyone has a good night. Thank you, you too. Yeah, good night. Thank you. All right. Um, uh, Jess, I would love to present if you have an update before our next meeting, which will be whatever the second Thursday in May is, the 14th, 15th, something like that. If you, um, if you, if you have, even if your update is, we've asked for this information or um, we've gotten this information and, you know, here's what it is, but we haven't distilled it yet or whatever it might be. Um, or we're planning a PD for June, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I would be very happy to present it at the May meeting. And I'll, 100%. I'll put yep. my email in the chat. Excellent. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. I will um, make sure that gets to you and, you know, even sooner than, um, than a month from now because um, yeah, it's just this, there is an urgency to this. So I don't know if there's an email with um, the family connections group that, you know, we have one bit. with, with no. the reps, but not, um, okay. Not people who are not on the board. Cause with these zoom ones, it's really just board people who come. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah, it's, yes just hard I totally understand yes yeah that's a whole nother accessibility issue but then so is doing it only in person yay problems both ways well, hybrid yeah that's no I'm I'm just my my spouse is Andrew Trolley the band teacher at Marcy and yes. I already told him he has to figure out how to make this a hybrid option yes so we can go in person yeah. And it won't, it'll take a little bit for it to work all out. Won't be perfect the first time, but it, they will be hybrid. It's totally doable. It's a hundred percent doable. It's just and we finding live in the Minnesota. right course. We live in Minnesota. All meetings should be hybrid because you yeah. never know three quarters of the year if you're going to be able to drive to the school or not. Yes. Yeah. And I think making it hybrid encourages more people to come, which will be what we talked about and in, in creating more of those opportunities to get more people. So yeah, I love that idea. I'll, I'll pressure Andrew at school <laughs> to make that happen. Oh, I have no doubt that I will. All right. I, I officially adjourn this meeting. I think I'm all slap like happy tired at this point. But thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah, Jessica, thank you so much for coming and sticking around so long. Too. Yes. Oh, of course. I, th it's a huge passion of mine. Um, and I, you know, uh, I worked with Anissa Parks back in the day. We were, I was a literacy DPF. She was math DPF. We were on the same, the turnaround team. And, um, you know, she reached out last night and said, I heard you're co-chairing the equity team and that you're going to come talk to us and she was really excited and um because she was part of she was our school improvement specialist when I was at Pillsbury and so knows a lot of the work that we did there so um it needs to happen our kids deserve it and um you know that it's one of the things that that fuels me um day in and day out is to make sure that our kids get the best and everything that they deserve so um Super glad to be here. Super glad that um, we're kind of forging this new partnership. Yeah. So I appreciate you. you all. Yeah, thank you. Have a great night. Good night thank all. you all. And don't hesitate to email Hannah or myself if anything else pops in your mind. Good night. Thank you.